Dr. Andre Perry is currently Assistant Professor of Higher Education at the University of New Orleans and Associate Dean of the College of Education and Human Development. He is also the CEO of the UNO Charter Schools. Dr. Perry earned the PhD from the University of Maryland College Park in 2003. His primary research interests revolve around immigrant educational rights and migrant education. He provides weekly political breakdowns of K through 16 leadership and governance in Louisiana and the column he writes for Louisiana Weekly newspaper titled In Analysis. A condensed version of his article can be heard every Friday afternoon on WWNO 89.9 during NPR's All Things Considered. Dr. Perry is a recipient of several million dollars in federal, state, and private grants for his research in leadership and public school reform efforts currently underway in New Orleans. Recently, he, along with Sharon Clark of Sophie B. Wright Charter School, was elected, was appointed, I'm sorry, to mayor-elect Mitch Landrieu's education task force. The task force will work over the transition period to identify strong partnerships and collaborations between city government, nonprofits, schools, teachers, teach and parents to produce positive opportunities that create successful and productive New Orleans youth. The title of Dr. Perry's presentation this afternoon is, I Will Own My Education, I Will Own My School, The Lost Purposes of Black Education in New Orleans Post-Katrina Reforms. Please welcome Dr. Andre Perry. Good afternoon. See several of my friends and colleagues here, so support me, please. Um, it's interesting because we're going to, uh, we heard a lot about the need for federal education. I'm actually going to go the need for self-help and the, hi the historical importance of that on the, oh, yep, I will need that. What's that? Okay, good. Um, and the importance of that on the influence on education reform in the main. The title of the, of the conference, Before and After Katrina, Black Education in New Orleans, forces its participants to deal with what has become a powder keg, black education, particularly in New Orleans where black education is the cause celebre for both neoliberal reformers and post-civil rights educators. We rarely gather to discuss the state of black education for fear that the discussion itself would destroy any hope of imp improving our communities. When talking about my participation in this conference to another charter school manager, the response was, oh, you're in the anti-charter conference. Nationally, situating black education in a post-racial environment has become increasingly perilous. The post-racial reform mantra of no excuses does not allow for what are perceived to be old paradigms of schooling. In a multicultural, multi-ethnic society, where does the supposed antiquated idea of black education fit? How did we come to a time and place when and where organizing a conference on black education in New Orleans would require a great deal of courage? And I would like to thank Nagana Lewis, Dr. Nagana Lewis, for really having that courage to put this on. Black education is strongly associated with failure. Whether the referent is on student outcomes, pedagogy, philosophy, and or leadership, black education is seen as the nettlesome ghost of civil rights past. Ordinarily, people use the term to describe the academic outcomes of black students and their units of analyses are typically public inner city schools. This is why the term achievement gap typically follows conversations on black education. In addition, black education is what is at stake on the battlefield for control of public schools. In this regard, black education describe, describes who or what doesn't work to manage schools with black children. While these are definite components of black education, limiting the definition of black education to the achievement gap or management ignores other important analytic precepts that make black education worthy of many conferences. 
The aim of this paper is to provide some historical context and theoretical boundaries on the concept of black education. I then distill one of its prominent principles and offer a quantitative model to measure its qualities. Can you uh, click for me there? Black education is not simply a descriptor of ethnic concentration in educational institutions. The construct of black education comes from a historical context with a set of principles and assumptions that have formed numerous theories and frameworks that can evaluate phenomena and conditions. While these frameworks can be placed on continuums of varying scales, the historical progression of blacks in the Americas strongly influenced what scholars have come to understand to be black education. Certainly there is a history prior to the involuntary migration of, Afri of Africans via the slave trade or from col colonialization in the main. However, it is impossible to frame black education in the United States without including former African slaves struggle for universal education in the South. The seminal historiography, what I believe the seminal historiography to be, and since I'm up here, that's what counts, of the story comes from James D. Anderson's The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860 to 1935. Whereas other activists, teachers, educational leaders, and researchers have written extensively on antebellum education through Reconstruction, few compile the historical data as comprehensively and as thoroughly as Anderson. Anderson clearly articulates and demonstrates the central purposes of black education as rooted in former slaves' quest for education. However, the struggle is not simply a quest for universal or public education as an end. Anderson suggests that public or universal education was a political byproduct of ex-slave self-determination to form literate cultural communities. During Reconstruction, philanthropic activity among missionaries and industrialists led to the opening of hundreds of schools in post-Civil War South. Republicans, Northern Missionary Association, and the Freedmen Bureau created through, post -war, through their post-war influence a system of schools led by a superintendent. Government-sponsored schools with the aim of instructing former slaves sprouted up uh, in the southern states. However, the, upon the Freedmen survey of the educational terrain, officials found native schools, schools taught by ex-slaves already in existence. The ex-slave's thirst for education illustrates an essential principle in black education. Evidence of self-reliance manifested in the establishment of schools can help us understand the quality of black education pre and post Katrina. If there is a primary, central, or central pr purpose to the principle of self-reliance manifested in education, it has to do with literacy's connection to membership or citizenship. Historically, the removal of schooling rights prevented the actualization of membership or citizenship in a country. Illiteracy helped maintain the institutions of slavery and Jim Crow, which removed black residents' capacity to become full-fledged members of the Americas. Membership is one of the most important and basic allocative uh, decisions in a political community because it bestows whom we deem, because whom we bestow, because whom we deem as members determines with whom we make choices, for, for whom we require obedience and collect taxes, and to whom we allocate goods and services. Membership in members refers to the group of people in a political community who are committed to dividing, exchanging, and sharing social goods, first of all amongst themselves. In general, society is amenable to, uh, amenable and or morally obligated to provide resources to those it deems its members. Denial of membership limits important communal goods often necessary for residents to self-actualize. This was all too evident in the practice of slavery and the maintenance of discrimination. Slavery is the penultimate example of the denial of full membership. Slavery is antithetical to membership. A denial of full membership leads to what we commonly refer to as second-class citizenry. Second-class citizenry is evidenced by intolerable life outcomes. For purposes of this paper, the reverse should be applied. Gross undesirable life outcomes can serve as evidence as a denial of certain communal goods. The brown and black bodies trapped in the Superdome 
and Convention Center provided incredibly strong evidence that the education generations received prior to the storm had not served its most basic functions. Many residents did not have the means and or wherewithal to remove themselves from an imminent threat to life itself. Katrina's tragedy was the man-made disaster of a pitiable educational system. If black education is princi principally about literacy's connection to membership and we espouse that legacy, then we cannot replicate systems and behaviors that led to the Katrina example. In addition, we should assume the presence of an intense thirst for education among those who endured the atrocities and for those who watched. As it was during the late 19th century, self-reliance drives a framework of black education which relentlessly seeks to reform systems that will improve quality of life. Radical reform is necessary if membership is not attained. So I want to go into some of the historical evidence before I start to pull together my quantitative model of how we capture this notion of self-reliance. Principles that construct a black education framework can contribute mightily to understanding the current strengths and weaknesses of New Orleans post-Katrina. For instance, with the goal of black self-sufficiency, the American Missionary Association placed normal schools and colleges in the center of their strategy to uplift blacks in the South. The AMA explicitly sought to provide training to blacks who would in turn help other blacks. It was assumed that black teachers could promulgate and reproduce the values and skills needed for their social advancement. In 1869, through the, through the financial support of the Congregational Church, the AMA opened the doors of Strait University. Initially named after the wealthy cheese manufacturer uh, from Ohio, Seymour Strait, who provided the initial endowment gift, Strait University is now known as Dillard University. Therefore, teacher and principal training is a central component of black education. In a multicultural post-Katrina context, the degree to which schools and communities farm local talent towards teacher and principal ranks should give us a measure of self-reliance. The struggle for autonomy also was a central feature in, of black education. While northern sponsors of southern educationists agreed that blacks should reach some level of education, Weak linkages existed between northern missionary societies, northern industrialists, and southern education foundations. Northern missionary society, uh, nor the AMA's egalitarian and post-secondary be beliefs did not comport with the segregationist leanings of the industrial foundations, industrialists and foundations. Faced with flight to northern cities, industrialists, industrialists sought education which supported the economic goals of the region. Industrialists aimed to educate blacks so they, had, so they could adapt their net to their natural environment. Black civil rights activists' desire for racial equality contrasted the key foundation's desire to maintain a racial hierarchy and political structure, as well as the northern paternalistic ideals around education. Black recipients of various educational movements wanted the freedom to create their own pedagogy, pedagogies, rules, and schools. We should remember the caution which W.E.B. Du Bois noted about the Freedmen's Bureau. He believed that the Bureau certainly set forth a system of free labor, free public schools, and black businesses. However, quote, it failed to guard its work wholly from paternalistic methods that discourage self-reliance. Decentralization after the storm did certainly dismantled the centralized bureaucracies that limited site-based autonomy. The expansion of the Recovery School District, numerous charter schools, and charter management organizations have the potential for facilitating self-reliance. From a framework of black education, decentralization, charter schools, and site-based autonomy can all be inherent goods. Still, we should be careful to examine the school processes and procedures which can limit self-reliance at school and student levels. Therefore, what variables should researchers examine to measure self-reliance, and what outcomes should researchers use against those variables to measure their quality? From, from the history, self-reliant schools are close to what Kenneth Strike considered shared educational projects. 
and you can click. Self-Reliant Schools provide a, the vision of education that is shared by all members of the community. Self-Reliant Schools' cohesiveness and strength come from the operationalization of that shared vision. They maximize the principle of self-reliance through the organization. Their maximization ideally will lead to the outcomes that are sought by that vision. So I have a hypothesis, so we can start to talk now. If you click. If self-reliance leads to better academic outcomes, then schools and students that have higher levels of self-reliance will show greater success. The reason why I want to go this route, because quite frankly, I'm a little bit tired of hearing that uh, selective admission schools um, are trumped, that um, charter schools are bad, that um, RSD schools are bad, and we lump these schools in these specific categories and give the very trite, uninformed responses to them. I really believe that if we go to some type of um, multi-factor analysis to really see at what about these schools work and what doesn't work, then we can get at the, the gist of what makes a good school. And I really believe that black education can teach us in this regard. So if, can we go to the, the next? So then I have some important research questions that I would like to answer. Does, what is the relationship between self-reliance and student achievement? Does site-based autonomy and student locus of control predict student achievement? Is there a relationship between site-based autonomy and student achievement? And what's the relationship, relationship between self-reliance and college access and success? Now, the reason why I throw college access and success, now remember the, his, um, the history, schooling had to be about improving life outcomes. In today's society, if you do not go to college, you will have a, a um, um, less likely chance of having health care, less likely chance of having a, a well-paying job, less, uh, less likely of a chance to live in a decent neighborhood. All these things are contingent upon a credential. So I want to find a way to measure that, but that's problematic because ultimately you've got to measure a ACT, and that's a, um, a selective um, population, right? But we're going to go with it anyway. So we did a, obviously I did a historical analysis. In the full paper, I go through many examples that show how I get at these variables. Then I actually, um, over the last year, I've been creating student satisfaction surveys and teacher and parent satisfaction surveys which can answer some of these questions that I can't get from state um, databases and sources, AFRs, um, other pieces. And then linear regression is used. And um, for those who are not statisticians, um, bear with me. I think the explanation of the variables um, for this particular conference is, um, is more important. So if we go forward. So I want to measure this outcome right? Eighth grade, leap, um, or math, ACT, those are more reliable variables when you're measuring. They have a little bit more collinearity and all this other good stuff, and school performance score, right? But then I have these major buckets that are essentially factors that are comprised of um, uh, multiple um, survey items that address demographics, prior achievement, school autonomy, student um, and student body characteristics, teacher and faculty characteristics, principal leader characteristics, school characteristics, parent involvement, and community support. So let's roll. Obviously, there's a bunch of demographic stuff. We can go to the next one. Um, um, prior achievement. Know that um, what accounts for most of the variance when you're doing a study, demographics, and, pr and um, prior achievement. It can account for up to 70% of variance, meaning it, it it makes up, it, 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 it essentially predicts what's going to happen in the future. It's a big chunk of that. What you score on a pretest in statistical sense has a high degree of predictability of what you're going to do, right? So let's go to the next one. School autonomy. Now, autonomy is an interesting concept because so many of the reformers hinge on this ideal. So I wanted to get, get, get at what makes autonomy, and it, are these things factors in predicting successful outcomes? So the number of schools operated by a governing board. I run four charter schools. So I'm assuming, I want to know, is that good? Is that impactful? Or is that bad? Is it better to have one? Is it better? 
What's that? Right, right. So that's what we're going to me measure. So uh, what this does, it, it controls for these things. So then you can tease out schools that have four versus who have one. You can see if those factors will um, be impactful. Number of external funding sources. So we can pull from um, audit reports, and, they, um, and they, really audit reports, the number of external um, funding sources. And then what is interesting, we can do the amount of external funding sources as a percent of budget, because that will give us a sense of um, how, m how much external funding they can use to free themselves up if they are locked into just one. So if you just have received state funding, you're not going to be an autonomous school, for instance. The amount of school leader control, uh, amount of, of school leader control, um, amount of money of school leader, that a school leader controlled, money is a percent of budget. Okay, that, I, I messed that wording up. But the, it's in essence how much money a leader can control, discretionary money. And, the, and they, we can actually pick that up on the AFR in terms of discretionary, discretionary money. Percent of expenditures used on direct instruction. This is also a key figure that I'm, I'm pointing in. And again, this is drawn from my uh, historical analysis. Next slide. Student characteristics, this is important. Locus and control. So locus and control is the idea um, of self-efficacy. I argue that um, from the historical analysis, students that believe in themselves um, come out of a very cohesive school, that there's a, some type of comprehensive doctrine in that school that they leave with to say, this is who I am, this is what I'm about, and it impacts their vision and it, it creates um, schools um, that have a high degree of autonomy will show students with high locus of control. That's what I'm theorizing, right? Um, Student-teacher relationship, this will go in the survey. Percent free and reduced lunch, some of these are basic. Percent going on to college, percent dropout, percent expulsion push out. As, and these, these are where it gets more difficult to, to pull some of the data, but we're going to try. And percent taking the ACT, SAT, right? Um, teacher and faculty characteristics, characteristics. Teacher parent relations. And I keep going back to this relationship because schools that, again, are cohesive, and it's not saying that they have to like each other. But there is a common shared vision or understanding what that school is about. That's what I'm seeking through um, the survey data. Years on the job. Again, from the historical analysis, a lot of the schools that were successful in the past actually grew their teachers in the local community, and they had longstanding history. In today's context, when you look at um, places like Ben Franklin, MLK, um, um, Lusher, they have a higher degree of older teachers. I want to see what factor that, what role does that play, right? Years at the school, highest degree earned, percent teacher certified, percent teaching in their field, um, teacher turnover rate, um, percent living in um, district prior to Katrina. This goes back to that whole notion of homegrown, right? Um, we're almost done here. Um, principal leader characteristics, principal teacher relationship, um, principal leader turnover, years of experience, years at school, principal qualifications, years in district, and number of teachers hired. How many teachers have that, uh, how, uh, has that pr uh, principal hired? And that was to get at the, the hiring and firing ideal. So I couldn't get at um, how many teachers, how many teachers that principal fired because some schools may not experience that, that are good schools. So I had to go the reverse because I think um, teachers, good teachers sometimes leave, and we can get a number that, um, that it captures that. Next one. Oh, school characteristics. Percent of budget dedicated to capital expenditure. Number of computers, number of library books. These generally capture the ideal of investment. What we saw in the historical literature, some schools, the early school, invested mightily in, the sc in their schools, and that contributed to their sense of autonomous schools. Um, there was actually, um, man, I'm forgetting a name of schools no longer in existence, but it was one of the first schools during um, DSEG, and it, and it described how the entire town contributed their own monies towards the, the, the f um, founding of this school. And so 
these kind of things will um, try to operationalize that idea. Percent of academic support, um, non-instruction support. Now, this is the hardest part, and it's probably some of the most important <laughs> blocks when you're throwing it in the um, uh, regression model, is parent, uh, parental and community involvement. It is very difficult to get solid measures of this. And so I know, I mean, maybe you can offer them up in the future um, after this session, but we looked at all the data that's available and even tried to think about survey items, um, but it is very difficult to come with solid measures for this. But it's important because all the, the historical analysis talk about the involvement of the community in some respect. So implications. So all these things go into the model, and then I'm going to test them, right? That's my big project for the next year. But the, the takeaway here is that, um, for me, is that eventually we have got to get, at, uh, get beyond some of the descriptive statistics and really go after what works. Because in the main, we know that there are more su uh, successful, whatever that's supposed to mean, schools than there were pre-Katrina. Now we have to get at what is different about them, right? What is happening? And for me, self-reliance is something that is so akin to autonomy that if I study it, then it will, it will answer some questions. And there's an ulter ulterior motive as well because um, the added value models that I, I constantly see are almost always slated against university versus Teach for America things. And I think there's a different cut. There's a different way to go about what contributes to the growth of a school. And this is one of them. So with that said, um, I would like to thank you. Give me your suggestions for those last two items. Look for this um, in, uh, hopefully in the next calendar year. And, and um, again, thank you for your time and your energy.